Welcome to the Global Governance Perspective, a podcast presented by the Global Governance Institution, where we pull together international expertise to contribute to global governance. I'm retired Captain Andy Tian, the founder and the president of the Global Governance Institution.、Uh, this is our very first episode. Given the rising number of allegations of genocide in recent years, for instance, in Sudan, Burma, Iraq, China, as well as the sharply different opinions either for or against those allegations, it is more than timely to kick off this debut episode on genocide in international law. What are the international benchmarks for constituting the crime of genocide in international law? Why are there sharply different views in its application? To answer those questions and concerns, today we are very glad to welcome Professor William Sabas, who teaches public international law at the Mid Middle Sex University of UK, Leiden University of Netherlands, and the National University of Allen Galwin. Professor William Sabas is the author of a number of books on public international law. Including a very authoritative monograph entitled "Genocide in International Law: The Crime of Crime." In this book, he gave a comprehensive analysis of the history and application of the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. He is one of the best experts in this area to share perspective with us. So let me first. To invite Professor William Shabbat to say hello to audiences both in China and around the world, Professor William. Yes, very nice to see you, Andy,、um, and I'm very happy to be with you for the for this podcast and to speak a little bit about some of the legal aspects of the crime of genocide from the perspective of international law. I think, as you know, this is a a term that is used、uh, in a variety of Circumstances, it has a precise legal definition, but it is frequently used in other contexts, and this has created a lot of confusion where allegations are made of genocide that are not really consistent with the international legal definition. Thank you, Professor, for joining us. Let me start with the historical origin of this crime. What is the background and purpose when establishing? The crime of, gen- of genocide after World War Two. Yeah, the the word genocide was invented in 1944, in the, as World War Two was coming to an end. There were a number of attempts to try and and describe and define new crimes at the international level,、uh, in order to deal principally with the atrocities committed by、uh, the Nazi Germany,、uh, the government of Nazi Germany. And、uh, one of them was the was the notion of genocide. For the great trial that took place at Nuremberg of the International Military Tribunal, the term "crimes against humanity" instead of genocide was actually used in the in the charter of the tribunal and by the judges. And、uh, a very similar definition was used by the International Military Tribunal of the Far East, what we call the Tokyo Tribunal. The the definition of genocide was developed、uh, in some ways in reaction to the definition of crimes against humanity at Nuremberg,、um, out of a sense that the definition of crimes against humanity, as it was used at Nuremberg, was inadequate,、uh, was incomplete, and the reason was that it didn't deal with atrocities committed in peacetime. We can say the same about the Tokyo Tribunal. It was less significant in a way.、Uh, the issue of crimes against humanity, because、uh, the Japanese didn't commit atrocities against their their own citizens, against their own people, which was not the case, of course, with the with the Germans. So the notion of crimes against humanity emerged,、uh, or rather, of genocide. The definition of genocide as an international crime emerged late in 1946, following the Nuremberg、uh, trial. And it emerged in order to deal with、uh, severe atrocities committed during peacetime against national, ethnic, racial, and religious groups. And it was 
it was addressed uh, and discussed in a General Assembly resolution, a resolution of the General Assembly adopted in December of 1946, but only defined in a definitive sense, in a definitive legal sense, by the uh, Gen General Assembly of the United Nations in the 1948 convention. So the definition of genocide adopted in 1948 is in one sense broader than the definition of crimes against humanity used at Nuremberg because it deals with atrocities committed in peacetime. But it's much narrower in another sense because it, unlike crimes against humanity, it only deals with certain groups and Moreover, and this is really the most important facet of it, it only deals with um, uh, the destruction of the group. And that's been understood since then in the interpretation by important courts and tribunals, including the uh, temporary tribunal set up by the United Nations for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, as well as by the International Court of Justice, the World Court, in two important decisions as requiring um, the intent to destroy the group in a physical sense, that is to exterminate the group physically. And so this is where this is really the heart of the debate because in many of the recent cases where the term genocide has been used, there is very weak evidence um, or, or no real serious evidence to demonstrate an intent to destroy the group physically. Thank you, William, for the historical background and its evolution. There have been many debates over the crime of genocide, like the uh, conference on Xinjiang held uh, early September in uh, Newcastle University. Apparently, the uh, existence of the different views relates to the understanding of the concepts of the crime of genocide in international law. So using the, the legal term to explain it according to the Genocide Convention, what are the material and the mental elements of the crime of genocide? Have the elements of this crime changed anyway so far since it's uh, established in the convention? Thank you. Like all legal texts, of course, there is, uh, there is often a great deal of space for interpretation. And some of the people, there have been various interpretations proposed of the definition of genocide in the Genocide Convention. I think that to be fair, there are also many um, people, activists, some academics who have their own definition of genocide, who are dissatisfied with the definition of genocide in the convention. And they use it and they advance other approaches and other definitions using the word, but clearly and often admitting that these are not covered by the by the definition, the legal definition. So what I'm going to, I'm not going to address that that's outside the sphere of international law. With international law, we're dealing with the definition, which is essentially in Article 2 of the 1948 Genocide Convention. And that definition has been repeated over and over again, confirming that it is very much the established international legal definition of genocide. So we find word for word the same definition in Article 6 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, in the statutes of the uh, international criminal tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda and so on. Now that definition speaks about destruction, but it doesn't uh, speak of physical destruction. Nevertheless, as interpreted by the major international courts, there's a requirement of physical destruction. I don't think there's any doubt about this in terms of the, the applicable international law. I recently participated in a webinar where there was another international lawyer who was saying, well, no, it's open to debate whether physical destruction is required. But I, I think that's quite wrong. I don't think, I mean, you can say that anything is open to debate, but when you have judgments of the major international tribunals that are essentially unanimous on this point, one, one cannot claim that this is a question that is open for discussion anymore. This is simply ignorant to, to suggest that. So the physical elements, uh, are, there are two pieces, two parts to the physical elements. There's a list of physical acts of genocide that begins with killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. And then it goes on to talk about preventing births and so on. As a general rule, these physical acts of genocide are not very difficult to prove. 
uh, in, uh, in, in all of the allegations of genocide, there is some basis for claiming one of those five acts has been committed. Uh, when we have the second act, which is causing mentally, mental harm to members of a group, it's really not very difficult to make evidence that some act that was committed by a government or by, by, uh, by an organization has caused serious mental harm to members of a group. But the difficult part uh, is with the, the in demonstrating that, that was done with the intent to destroy the group physically. And people say this is very hard to prove. And of course, it's true. It's extremely difficult to prove because you can make the evidence of an intent to do something. When you have a crime that requires evidence of an intent, we call that specific or special intent in criminal law, you need to, uh, you can do it in two ways. One of them is to prove it with direct evidence. So if, if somebody, if a country says, we are going to destroy that group. Then you have direct, you have direct evidence. That they've admitted what they intend to do. But, but very often governments and criminals, individual criminals don't demonstrate what their intent is. Sometimes individual criminals say what they intend to do. They do it now on social media. But in the absence of that evidence, and in most of the recent cases where allegations of genocide has been made, there's no direct evidence of a government or of a group saying, we intend to destroy that group. And so then the way you prove the intent is by inference, by deduction, by looking at patterns of conduct, patterns of behavior that lead to the conclusion that this is what they intend to do. And that's a very uh, accepted technique in criminal law when we have to prove criminal intent we often have to prove it based on inferences drawn from the conduct of, of groups or people based on the fact that people intend the consequences of their acts. That's just an empirical observation. But here's the problem. When you're dealing with a crime that requires this special intent or this specific intent, you cannot convict somebody of the crime unless you can prove that intent beyond a reasonable doubt. And, and that means that if there's an alternative explanation for the conduct of the group, for the acts, an alternative explanation, as opposed to the intent to physically destroy the group, then you have to acquit. Then you have to conclude that you don't have the proof of genocide. And I, I hear this over and over again. People say, it's probable that they intended to, com to destroy the group. And my answer is, that's not good enough. You have to be certain. It has to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you, Professor. Let's turn to the real case scenario and talk about the Xinjiang once again. In addition to the uh, policy statements from the United States, uh, also there are some reports and the papers from NGOs uh, such as uh, New Lines Institute, uh, Australia Strategic and Policy Institute, and uh, individual papers like uh, uh, which was written by uh, Adrian Zanz from Germany. So regarding why the, their work crime of genocide in Xinjiang and taking those NGO reports as a reference, what are the main points of disagreements on this issue? Will you please highlight it once again? Some of them you have touched upon. Yes, well, uh, of course I've read, I don't know that I've read all of the reports, but I've read many of the different reports on the subject. Um, some of them are more serious than others. You refer to the work of Zentz on the question of uh, births, and he has done various statistical analyses. Um, and uh, I've looked at those, and I'm not, a, I'm not a statistician, but they don't lead to, to convincing evidence of an intent to destroy the group. There's a tendency, I think, to misrepresent the evidence that he has in some of the other reports. As I understand it, his evidence... Um, and again, I'm not saying that the evidence that, that I necessarily believe all the evidence, but I have to take it, uh, we have to assume that the evidence is, can, can be supported. But the evidence he produces is, is of uh, attempts in China to reduce the birth rate of Uyghurs so that it is a, a birth rate that is comparable to that 
of others in China. Uh, and not to prevent births altogether, but to reduce a birth rate that is greatly higher than the existing birth rate uh, on the average for, for people in the People's Republic of China. To me, this is not strong evidence of an intent to destroy the group. Uh, and it has many other explanations. We know that China for the last 40 years has had various policies directed at uh, limiting the number of births in the country. And we have to understand measures like that within that context. The, the mo most serious legal analysis, and that's really the part that I deal with because I'm an international lawyer. I'm not a demographer. I'm not a social scientist. When I read the report, there's a report by uh, uh, some barristers in London that has been widely circulated uh, and has been presented by Uyghur activists as establishing a good case for genocide. I don't think it establishes a good case at all. I read that report very carefully. And there's a point, there's a sentence in the middle of the report where they say that they do not have evidence, good evidence of the intent to physically destroy the group. They have lots of other evidence, they say, of, uh, that, that support allegations of genocide. They just don't have the crucial one. It's like saying that you're going, you have evidence that somebody committed a murder, but you just don't have any evidence or, or enough serious evidence they, they intended to kill the person. Well, then you don't have a crime. So I find that that report, it's very carefully worded. All, many of these reports are, are misleading in the formulation. So the report by the barristers looks like a lengthy analysis concluding that, that, that genocide is taking place in China. But, and it's been quoted that way by NGOs. I think it's been quoted that way by parliamentarians in Britain as support for the allegations of China, against China, except that it's flawed. It has a very serious flaw that's right inside the report where the authors of the report acknowledge. They admit that they don't have serious evidence of the intent to physically destroy the group. And if they don't have that, they can't say there's genocide. They just can't. As for the report by New Lines, which I've also read, the New Lines report um, is, uh, uh, is, is premised, is supported on an, an incorrect interpretation of the Genocide Convention. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there are others, and this is, this is in the New Lines report, they essentially dismiss the approach taken to the definition of genocide by the International Court of Justice, by the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, and by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. So this is the work of some international lawyers, some lawyers who wrote the report, who don't agree with the law. And, but they don't say that explicitly. It's not clear. What they should say at the beginning is put product warning. This, this, brochure, this booklet, this report on genocide is based on a disagreement with the mainstream interpretation of the crime of genocide by the major international courts. So, you know, I've given those examples. Uh, the State Department report, the United States Department of State report is absolutely worthless because they use the term genocide, but they, they don't give any uh, justification for it. They give no legal analysis. They list a whole lot of facts, factual allegations uh, against China, but it's impossible to determine which of those allegations is there to support a charge of genocide and which is to, there to support other claims. So they have, they have information about elections in China. They have information about free speech in China. These are obviously irrelevant to the issue of genocide, but it's impossible to determine. So the Department of State report is absolutely worthless. The New Lines report is in serious disagreement, profound disagreement with the mainstream of international legal tribunals today. And the report of the British barristers says that they don't have evidence of the intent to destroy the group. So none of these makes a reasonable case for genocide. I hope the audiences could get a deeper understanding after explanation, but still you invite me to uh, uh, ask you another question. Since you are also pra uh, practitioners, for those uh, individual papers and NGO reports like uh, the New Science and Andrew Zenz, 
are these reports more credible than the government reports? And could they be uh, admitted in the ICG or any international criminal, uh, criminal tribunals? We would like to have your comments. Well, the general rule before international courts and tribunals is that you have to, the evidence has to be reliable. Uh, it has to come from reliable sources. But international courts and tribunals are fairly flexible in the, in the evidence that is produced before them. So before the international criminal tribunals, the judges will, we say, admit the evidence. It doesn't mean that they will believe it, but they will consider it. They won't refuse to read these reports or to see these reports. Uh, the defense lawyers in a, in a criminal prosecution of an individual are, of course, going to challenge these reports and the reliability, particularly because the reports themselves don't indicate their sources. So it's a very, they're very unreliable in terms of evidence that could be used in court. Sometimes you will have a reliable report issued by a UN body, for example. Everything depends on the circumstances. The other thing is that these reports are in general not written by neutral uh, actors, but they're written at the request of one side trying to make an argument. And so they're, they're, they, they're not expert opinions. A proper expert opinion comes from somebody who weighs both sides and who is not there to try and argue a case for one side or the other. Um, at the internet, so in the international criminal tribunals, they, will, uh, they won't reject these reports. They will find their way to the file but it would be very, very unusual for judges to base a conviction of somebody on evidence that is only supported by one of these reports. Um, the other thing is the reports, as I've mentioned, are also full of opinions. So judges aren't really interested in other people's opinions. Judges make their own opinions, but sometimes the reports, uh, some, sometimes a report can be useful as a source of factual information, but I don't think these reports uh, do that. And they tend to be very circular because they, they quote each other. So one report quotes another report, and it looks like there's a bigger volume of, of evidence than there really is. Um, I don't think that the Uyghur case uh, it could, could easily find its way before either an international criminal uh, court um, or before the um, uh, International Court of Justice. China has not accepted the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. So I, I don't see practically how that case could come before the International Court of Justice. As for the uh, International Criminal Court, uh, I know that some lawyers, some barristers are trying to prepare charges against China in the hope that the prosecutor will try to prosecute them, but they are based on, not on the charge of genocide. They're based on allegations of deportation um, and that's a separate question. It would take another podcast to go into the debate about all of that. But I, I don't see that charges of genocide uh, dealing with the Uyghur situation can easily find their way to the either the International Criminal Court or to the International Court of Justice. Thank you, Professor. There are also, there are also some human rights violations or even atrocities in some other countries, Western countries, let me be frank, for instance, it's the United States has a problem of uh, of black matters, uh, black lives matters in Canada. They are uh, unmarked graves, and also the Australian soldiers were crimes in Afghanistan. So, could there be any kind of forms of accountability for those alleged uh, crimes or uh, all, all, uh, crimes of atrocities by Western countries? If not, why? Well. You know, the, the United Nations from the very beginning has been an institution that was based on the one hand on the equality of states from um, of, of all countries, uh, bearing in mind that five countries have a very special position as permanent members of the Security Council. But it's, a, it's not a regional body. It's not a body that's premised on one part of the world dominating another part of the world, in theory. But of course, when the United Nations was created, in practice, uh, some of the European countries uh, had colonial empires. They only gave them up uh, 15 years or more later. Um, and the United Nations has had a history in dealing with human rights 
of double standards. Um, for example, the United, the United Nations was very initially uh, had difficulty dealing with racial discrimination, partly because the United Nations was headquartered in the United States and the United States had a big influence on the United Nations. And uh, the United States had and still has a very serious problem with racial discrimination. So the, the focus on racial discrimination when the, in the United Nations only came later. When the Charter of the United Nations was being drafted in 1944, at the very, very beginning, uh, a Chinese diplomat proposed that an idea that had originated in Japan in 1919 to have a declaration on racial discrimination in the Charter of the United Nations was dismissed by the United States and the United Kingdom. And it was only when African countries joined the United Nations in large numbers that racial discrimination became an important issue. So uh, I'm giving that as an example. It's an institution that on the one hand is universal in scope, but it's uh, on the other hand, an institution that is, is influenced by the politics of the time, by the membership of the organization. And, and that continues to this day. So uh, in the West, people will say that, that China escapes criticism, at certainly in bodies like the Security Council, because it has the veto. The same can be said of the United States and of some of the countries it protects, like, like Israel. There are mechanisms in the United Nations that have been accepted by some countries, very few of them by the United States, and very few of them by, by China. And it's voluntary, so those countries have to accept those mechanisms in order to be uh, subject to a, a certain level of mechanisms of, of control of, of human rights or of monitoring of human rights. Only a, a few weeks ago, the American Secretary of State, Blinken, said that the United States would welcome uh, what are called the special rapporteurs of the United Nations to come and investigate racial discrimination in the United States. He is now being attacked brutally in, uh, in the right-wing media in the United States for doing this. So there are, there are, there are opportunities to, to address human rights violations by, by, by various governments, big and small, members of the United Nations. Some of them escape because they're not in the United Nations, like, like Taiwan, for example. Taiwan is one of the hardest because Taiwan is not a member of the United Nations. Um, and uh, until, uh, we have some resolution of the of the situation uh, uh, that that's going to that's going to remain. I don't want to get into that issue just to say that there are some some black holes in terms of dealing with human rights within the United Nations. There are some countries that accept the mechanisms with considerable enthusiasm and others that don't. You mentioned Canada, which is a country I know well. I come from Canada, and I'm painfully aware of the evidence of the abuse of uh, indigenous peoples in Canada uh, historically, but also at the present day. And Canada is more exposed to these mechanisms. Canada is going to be severely criticized internationally, but uh, it varies from one country to another, and it depends on the, on the issues as well. Thank you. Last question. Uh, let's turn to, uh, you have mentioned some updates on the Xinjiang issue in in June uh, 2021, uh, Ronnie Dixon and his team have submitted new evidence to the International Criminal Court to try to persuade uh, prosecutors to open an investigation into alleged forced deportations of Uyghur Muslims into China from Tajikistan as legal basis. The, uh, they, they, taking, they are taking the legal basis at the situation in Bangladesh Myanmar case. Uh, this lawyer thinks that the ICC may exercise jurisdiction over crime when part of the crimes conduct uh, conduct take place in the territory of a state party. In this case, Tajikistan is a state party to the Rome statutes. So uh, could they follow the same logic of Rohingya case? Uh, what do you expect the impact of these new submissions um, from Dixon? Thank you. Yes, I, I haven't seen the submissions, so I don't know what new uh, evidence they had. My understanding was that the, the, the first stage that they need to overcome, the first, uh, the first stage they need to do in getting a case before the International Criminal Court is to convince the prosecutor 
to proceed. And last December, the prosecutor said that she was not going to proceed. I don't think it was about the sufficiency of the evidence so much as the fact that the the, ex, the alleged expulsions or, or deportations from Tajikistan into China weren't really covered. They weren't the same as the Bangladesh-Myanmar situation because the Bangladesh-Myanmar situation involved people being driven out of a, of a country that wasn't a member of the court, Myanmar, into a country that was. And they said, well, that's, that's the crime of deportation because you're driving people out of their homes. They said this was not the same with the with deportations from Tajikistan into China, because people weren't being driven out of their homes. They said that was the that was the thinking of the prosecutor, and the prosecutor has very great discretion in this area. So I wouldn't think that new evidence about deportations from Tajikistan into China is going to assist um, uh, Rod Dixon and and his his team and the case that they're trying to make. I understood from Rod Dixon that what he's planning to do is to try and develop a case that there have been deportations or expulsions from China to other countries and to try and demonstrate that that's a situation similar to what went on in uh, Myanmar and Bangladesh. And there, uh, the, the situation would be much more similar to the Myanmar-Bangladesh situation, which has been approved that, that theory about the case has been approved by the prosecutor and by some of the judges. It's not been challenged properly. Uh, it, it was presented by the prosecutor to the judges and the judges agreed, but it's not been contested by defense lawyers. I, I think that it's, it's a very controversial notion, but I can't predict the outcome. I, I just think that, that what has happened so far is that the judges have accepted the reasoning of the prosecutor but that's partly because the prosecutor's reasoning hasn't been attacked by lawyers arguing for the other side. I think there are some good arguments that the approach they've taken in Myanmar, Bangladesh is not a reasonable interpretation of the statute. And if that's the case, the attempts to, to address the situation with the Uyghur in China will also fail. And, and as I mentioned before, remember, this is not a genocide allegation. This is an allegation of the crime against humanity of deportation. There's no there's no way in which the Myanmar Bangladesh approach to jurisdiction uh, can work with the crime of genocide. Nobody suggested that. So that wouldn't work either for Myanmar or for the People's Republic of China. On behalf of the uh, audience at home and abroad, uh, thank you, Professor, for your insightful and informative analysis on the crime of genocide. We look forward to the publishing of your book in Chinese and so as well to welcome you and other experts to pay a visit to Xinjiang whenever the pandemic allows. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you very That's much. That's the podcast. That's Professor William Shabbat. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy our program. Please do follow us and subscribe to the Global Governance Perspective. You could also follow us on our Twitter and Facebook to write your comments. Look forward to your joining us next time. Bye.